Professor Stogi is one of the leading experts on aerosol composition and chemistry in India. He obtained his BSc and MSc in chemistry and subsequently a BA degree from Lucknow University. He joined Physics Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad in 1999 to pursue his doctoral research. He earned his PhD in the year 2005. Subsequently, he moved to Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, USA and University of Toronto, Canada to carry out his postdoctoral work. He has worked on various aspects of atmospheric aerosol chemistry and their effects. He joined back PRL Ahmedabad as an academic faculty in the year 2011 and is currently working as professor in Geosciences Division. His major research interest is to understand the source and process affecting the ambient aerosols and their impaction, sorry, and their implication on ecosystem and climatic change. He has published 83 research articles in reputed peer-reviewed international journals and contributed more than 100 conference papers in national and international conferences. He is serving as Vice President of Indian Aerosol Science and Technology Association. He is an editorial board member of Asian Journal Atmospheric Environment and also serves as knowledge partner in the National Clean Air Program. I now invite Professor Neeraj Astogi for the lecture. Thank you. Okay. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. You can share your screen, sir. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. you have to open your P uh, PPT. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to presentation mode. Is it looking fine? Can you see the presentation slide? Uh, okay, you make it full screen, sir. I have done that. Can you see that? Ah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so it is taking some time. Okay, sir, you can start, sir. Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. So firstly, I wish to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share whatever little bit I know about the subject which I am going to talk about. I am sorry I missed coming in person because of some other commitment. So I was listing the talks and I have seen the, the list of all the talks and most of the talks are related to aerosols in certain condition, mostly in reactor and certain type of aerosol. Now I will take it take you to ambient atmosphere and natural and anthropogenic aerosol. So before I start, I wish to acknowledge all my supervisors whom I learned whatever I have learned so far. So my supervisor from PRL, from Georgia Tech, from University of Toronto and then all the group members who actually do the real job means they are the one who are doing things. I am just taking the credit. And my wonderful collaborators who helped me in doing research from ground level up to stratosphere. And let me tell you that I am experimentalist. Whole experimentalist, I am not doing any modeling or any satellite based thing. I am doing ground based measurements. So with this, let us start. So we are talking about atmospheric aerosols. This is means very simple slide and most of us know about it. So what I want to say about here, that our atmosphere is actually like a cooking pan which cooks everything you put into it. So these, what are the ingredients we are putting? We are putting different type of primary and secondary aerosols. Primary aerosols means the particles which are coming directly from the sources or secondary aerosol means gases are coming and then those gases are converting into aerosols. The sources as we all know are various pollution sources, uh, forest fire, biomass burning, vegetation which are emitting VOCs like isopene, etc. Sea salt which are spread by um, sea, mineral dust, wind borne mineral dust we are talking about. So from whatever source, once aerosols are there in the atmosphere, then they start interacting with each other and then they move with the winds. Wherever winds are going, these aerosols are also going. And we all know that in lower atmosphere, the resistance time of aerosol is about a week. But within this week, they can travel thousands of kilometers depending upon wind direction and speed. So what happens when they are transporting into aerosols? During long distance transport, aerosol mixing, aging, chemistry, this take place. So what does that mean? Let us, let us try a little bit of a talk about it. So this blue part is 
aerosol. Which, now it is whether it is primary or secondary, it can be organic, sea salt, metal, dust, black carbon or anything. Then you have in the atmosphere you also have certain humidity or liquid water content. So depending upon the hygroscopity of this aerosol, you will attract the humidity and you will make it slightly aqueous. Once it becomes aqueous, then there can be faster diffusion of gases, gases like VOC, VOC is volatile organic carbon, then NOx, ammonia, variety of sulfur compound and sulfur gases. These gases react with different oxidants present in the atmosphere like uh, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, ozone, nitrate radical, etc. and form variety of secondary aerosol, which can be sulfate, nitrate, secondary organic aerosol. And we all also know that it, things are different during daytime, different during night time, so chemistry is different. And all during this long range transport process, there are multiple multi-phase chemistry processes are taking. When I am saying multi-phase, that means it involves solid, liquid and gas phase. So what happens? So what happens is the, from the emission you may have fine or coarse particles which are externally mixed. Externally mixed means say suppose you have different type of floor, ground floor, wheat floor, rice floor etc etc and you make pellets of them. So these all pellets have different taste, you, can see, you know that. Now once you put them in the atmosphere and atmosphere if it is mixing and making one bigger pellet which is well mixed. So then original property of those particles are gone, now they are internally mixed particles. So this atmospheric processing actually converting externally mixed particle into internally mixed particle which changes the size, surface properties and optical properties. It also changes the bioavailability of nutrients. So what does that mean? What are these processes that we will see once the talk will progress? Okay, now let us talk about how uh, ambient aerosol affects our environment. So it affects in variety of ways which is mostly known. So it affects our climate. Climate when we are saying it means it is either radiation budget or hydrological cycle. Radiation budget means it is affecting the this uh, exchange of radiation from sun and earth and that is how it is affecting radiation budget. Hydrological cycle, these aerosol act as a seed for cloud formation. That is called cloud condensation nuclei. And that is how means without seed you can't make the cloud. So that is how it is affecting hydrological cycle. Then it affects air quality. Air quality includes uh, atmospheric chemistry, what we were talking in the previous slide. Means these aerosols are providing surface to the gases and they are interacting, those gases are interacting with each other. Then it affects human health, which we will be talking about in coming slides. It also affects visibility through formation of haze and fog. It means this is the uh, picture of satellite picture of India. And things are going, you see, in domestic pain, you can see this uh, plume. And this is uh, one typical mega city with a H, which is very common, we can see anywhere around. So, how they affect, we will be talking about. And then it also affects the aquatic ecosystem. When I am saying aquatic ecosystem, what it means? So, when we talk about the aerosol removal from the atmosphere, aerosol removal is actually the supply of nutrients over remote ocean and lakes. I will be talking in details about this and it also affects rain. So it can cause acid rain if you have too many of acidic species in the atmosphere or it can neutralize acid rain if you have too much dust, calcareous uh, dust in the atmosphere. So it can neutralize also. So anyhow, it affects acid rain. In all these effects, size and composition are the most important factors and atmospheric processing, as we were discussing in the previous slide, affect both size and composition of aerosol. So now let us talk about the different effects one by one. So first let us talk about the effect of uh, aerosol on earth radiation budget. So as we all know, we have sun, we have earth radiation going, coming. Things are in balance, everything is fine. But we also have aerosol in the atmosphere, variety of sizes you can see. These aerosol can scatter the incoming light or it can absorb. So that is how it is affecting the radiation budget. So if it is absorbing, it is warming the earth. If it is scattering, it is cooling the earth. This is called the direct effect. <coughs> now, as I said, these aerosols are acting as a cloud condensation nuclei. You are forming clouds, which can further reflect. So that is called indirect direct effect of aerosol. Now, for the same amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, if you are putting too many aerosols, that will reduce the droplet size, and that is how it can increase the cloud lifetime. 
and it can in affect the precipitation. The smaller part, smaller droplet will not easily precipitate. It can affect precipitation. So this is the figure from IPCC latest IPCC report, and here they have shown the effective rate of forcing for different species. So as you can see, that all greenhouse gases are having positive forcing. Positive forcing means they are warming. Negative forcing means they are cooling. So you can see that different type of aerosols are mostly scattering type, except black carbon, which is absorbing type and what else we see that you see these two different colors so one color is because of aerosol radiation interaction and one is aerosol cloud so that means direct and indirect effect they are talking about so overall what is the message here is different type of aerosol have different effects on earth radio forcing which is mostly negative so in a way one can say that aerosols are good for our earth but Means although they cool earth, but they have many adverse effects, which we will be talking in the coming slides. Now let us talk about aerosol and rain. So just one example I have taken. <coughs> this study by this foreign et al. They examined the relationship between aerosol abundance and rain rate over the globe. And this is the key factor in climate hydrological processes. What they did, they used satellite data. They used rain data from top, uh, this TRMM satellite, this tropical rainfall measuring mission. They used aerosol and cloud properties from MODIS and they used meteorological information from global data assimilation system. And they, what they found is this. So this is our whole globe. This bar chart is rain rate. So if it is dark, it is zero. If it is one, that means this is showing you the rain rate. And you see different grids. And these grids are plotted here. So what are these? And then you, have, you can see this red and blue color. So blue means in this grid you are considering zero rain. Means if, even if there is a zero rain, then also you are considering. And red is if, if there is zero rain, that you are not considering. What you overall see that rain rate is increasing linearly with AOD. AOD is aerosol optical depth, which you can consider as a measure of aerosol concentration in the atmosphere. So what you see that as aerosol concentration is increasing, rain rate is also increasing. And at, these are at different places, over ocean, over land, so different places of the globe. So there is a relation between aerosol and rain rate. But what is the mechanism? This is far from understood till now. Now moving further, aerosol affects our atmospheric chemistry, visibility and health. How? Let us talk about one by one. So let us first talk about the atmospheric chemistry. Now I am giving the results, I am showing the results. Actually how we see whether it is affecting or not. So see if you have this kind of reaction means if you have mineral dust in the atmosphere. And mineral dust is indicated by calcium carbonate. You have acidic component which are forming from NOx and SOx are coming in this are they are converting into sulfuric and acetic acid. If they are reacting they will form calcium sulfate, calcium nitrate via this reaction. So what is happening here? Mineral dust, we know that they are coarse particle. As the species, we know that they are forming through new particle formation. They are very fine particle. If they are in track, so they are ultimately forming coarse particle. So what will the effect? Mineral dust, which itself is actually hydrophobic and has less solubility. Because of this reaction, its solubility will increase and it will become, surface will become more hydrophilic. More hydrophilic means they can be acting as a better CCM. Then it also decreases the number concentration of fine particles. They were too large, once they react, the number concentration goes down. And since we are forming coarse particles, and we all know that coarse particles have uh, lesser resistance time, so that is why you are uh, reducing the resistance time of aerosol in the atmosphere. Now, what is the evidence for this? So this is what we have seen. See, this is for year 2001, 2002. And you see this anti-correlation. Anti-correlation between Ea by calcium and bicarbonate by calcium. What is Ea? Ea is excess acid given by Ta minus ammonium plus potassium and what is Ta is total acid which is estimated as sulphate plus nitrate. So we will not go too much in detail but you take it from me that if there is an anti-correlation which is proving that this reaction is happening in the atmosphere. So these all effects are there over western India. Now same thing if these aerosol are going to the ocean. Ocean we know there are too much of sea salt which are mostly sodium chloride. So if sodium chloride is reacting with sulfuric acid, it will form sodium sulfate and HCl. And this reaction also we observed that it is actually happening over marine atmospheric boundary layer of uh, northern Indian Ocean 
How? See the relationship. This is excess NSF sulfate and this is chloride deficit. Now what is chloride deficit? We know that chloride, uh, sodium chloride is NaCl. So if you know the sodium concentration, you can actually calculate the chloride concentration. So this is what you should actually have. But if you are measuring which is much less than what you should have, so that means there is a chloride deficient. This is we have plotted here and excess sulfate was plotted, uh, whatever excess sulfate you have measured, minus ammonium. And this linear relation again proving that this reaction is happening over the marine atmosphere. Now what, what is the implication of that? So this near quantitative chloride depletion was observed, which suggests that sea, salt, sea salts could serve as a potential sink for anthropogenic SO2 in the downward polluted marine environment. This loss of SCL which is coming out can be a large source of reactive chlorine that has implication to the oxidant chemistry in the marine atmospheric boundary layer, is MABL. Moving further, aerosol also affect visibility, this, images, this kind of images we have seen multiple times. The so same place under different conditions, so whether this is aerosol or a meteorological condition, we see this kind of differences often. It means even if we are looking out of our window, sometimes we see uh, this type of image or sometimes this type of image, which actually means by eye you can say whether air quality is good or bad. So to understand it further, what is the how it is visibility is affected? People have done different things. For example, this Wang et al. They have plotted this visibility versus as a function of PM 2.5 mass concentration, and you see three different colors here. This blue color is when humidity was less than 70 percent. This red color is when humidity was between 70 to 80 percent, and black is when humidity was more than 80 percent. So what you see, there, there is the effect of both mass concentration, PM, PM 2.5 mass concentration, as well as humidity. See here, this visibility is 10 km for both, but in this case, when humidity was 70 to 80 percent, only PM 2.5 mass concentration of 40 gave you this visibility, and when this uh, humidity was less than 70 percent, the PM concentration was 112. So that means there is a big difference in mass concentration, but humidity is only changing the visibility. But one more thing you see, there is a large scatter, means all these three lines you see, there is a large scatter, which likely due to the non-concentration of aerosol chemical composition while establishing this frequency. And this composition more, mostly should be water soluble species. Why? Because water soluble species are hygroscopic in nature. They love uh, uh, water vapor. So they attract water vapor. So, but they haven't considered, so this is likely the cause of this. So I will take you to another result. This is the study we have done over Patiala. This, this was the whole year, means year round measurement we have done there. And the samples were collected in day night pair. So what you see here is the PM 2.5 uh, PM 2.5 mass concentration during October, November, December, February, which is defined as, as different seasons here. So autumn, winter, spring, summer and rainy season. Blue is daytime and red is nighttime. So you can see the mass concentration, how it is changing. But if you see the water soluble fraction of this aerosol, that is not changing as mass fraction. So what we see, in autumn it was about 0.5, 0 0.45, that means about 45%. Here it was about 55 to 60%. Here again it was between 50 to 60%. And then in summer and in season it was low. So actually, effect will be, if you multiply this by this, that will give you the actual mass concentration of water soluble species in the atmosphere. So one can consider water solvage species fraction of aerosol in visibility, hair and fog studies. This contribution of water solvage species to ambient PM 2.5 over a particular varied a lot with season, uh, with season, with maximum contribution during winter and spring which was about 60% and minimum during uh, rainy season that was about 30%. So what is the implication of that? That it can be, you know, this can be the reason of you whatever haze or prolonged fog or poor visibility we see during winter work in North India. Moving further, this is the most important part as far as our society is concerned. Aerosol affect our health and we all know about this and mostly what we know that it affect our cardiovascular system, it affect our respiratory system through variety of diseases that are listed here. But there are growing evidences that the effect of air pollutions are much beyond these respiratory diseases. What are those effects? 
it can affect our brain, it can cause Alzheimer or cognitive decline, it can affect our nervous system, it can cause Parkinson disease, it affects our renal system, that means kidney diseases can cause, it affects our endocrine system, which may lead to obesity and diabetes, it affects our reproductive system, that means it diminishes fertility, premature birth, low birth weight. Now, even means it affect embryo. Soot particles are shown to reach the lungs and brain of the children even before they are born. So the effect of aerosol on health, health is much beyond respiratory diseases. And these studies are now coming up fast. And this effect can be acute or chronic. Acute effect means, suppose, suppose somebody is giving you potassium cyanide and person will die immediately, that is the acute effect. Chronic means somebody is giving you polonium or arsenic and you will die slowly, that is chronic effect. Now how deep aerosol, this aerosol can reach in our human body? This is a good presentation from these people. So what we see here that particle between 2.5 to 10 micron, they stay in this region, which have been most, mostly natural sources. PM 2.5, they can go deeper into lung. Which, are, which can be natural or in, from natural and anthropogenic sources. PM1, they can go further deep in alveolar region. And nanoparticles or ultrafine particles, they can pass through macrophage and get into bloodstream. And we understand that once the particles in bloodstream, they can reach any part of our body. So whatever we were discussing in the previous slide, you can relate with this. Now, how these particles are reaching a different part of our body and affecting. But what, what is happening? Particle go when means in, when we inhale and they come out also when we exhale. But a fraction of particle get deposited to the epithelial cells, which is lung, inside lung if you see whatever cells are there, that is called epithelial cells. But how to do the effect? What is happening? So this effect can be physical or chemical, means some, some aerosol particles are going and depositing at some place that can be physically damaging, means restricting the path or making some kind of clusters at some place of our body or it can affect chemically. Chemically means it is interacting with the cells wherever they are reaching, in surrounding cells they are interacting and causing variety of diseases. So the most acceptable proposed mechanism which is there is ROS imbalance. ROS is reactive oxygen species. And what people believe that aerosol oxidative, oxidative potential which is defined as the capacity of ambient aerosol to generate reactive oxygen species or deplete antioxidant. So whether it is generating or depleting antioxidant, it is increasing this part. So this is the most acceptable mechanism that because of increasing oxidant in our body, they are affecting. So this imbalance favoring oxidant or disfavoring antioxidant leads to damage, which is oxidative stress, inflammation or even cell death. So about this oxidative potential, uh, we were lucky that we could pioneer the oxidative potential aerosol discharge in India. That was with my, one of my PhD students, Anil Patel, and this is the kind of summary of his thesis. This paper is in review right now. So what we see here, we have collected aerosol from multiple places around in and around India. And just see what I am seeing. So this, this all pie chart are composition which are defined here. This black, green and red, different bars you can see. So black is mass concentration, green is OPV which is volume normalized oxidative potential and OPM is mass normalized oxidative potential. So what will, we will not go in details of what is OPM or what is OPV. Just take it from me that OPM or OPV is, are now considered as the measure of toxicity of aerosol. So what you understand from here that aerosol concentration, see means this bar are not same. Some, in some places this black bar is much higher than this uh, red and green. Some places black bar is small, this red and green are higher. Some places they are similar. So that means mass concentration and their toxicity is not going one into one. Means some places you can have very high mass concentration but aerosol may be much less to toxic and some places you may have very less aerosol concentration but they can be very toxic. That depends upon the composition of their, those aerosols. So, based on our research over variety of <coughs> urban, semi-urban, mountains and marine regions, what we found is this OP, oxygen potential of biomass burning derived species is higher than fossil fuel derived species. So, we should worry about biomass burning 
is emitting more toxic species compared to fossil fuel. Ethogenic aerosol, OP is higher than natural aerosol, which is expected. So obviously means man-made aerosols are having higher oxidative potential. One other means one important thing, which is the reason of this uh, black and uh, this uh, green and red higher than black over these two regions. Atmospheric aging and fog processing increase aerosol OP. So that is how even though mass concentration is less, OP is high because whatever aerosols you are getting is mostly transported along this endogastric plane. So during the aging, they become more toxic. And then aerosol OP is governed by chemical composition rather than the total mass concentration. So overall the take home message from this work is that the medication strategies for reducing aerosol concentration alone may not be sufficient. Suppose if we want to improve the air quality of certain regions and we are aiming to reduce the aerosol mass concentration, that will not be sufficient as far as health is concerned. Linking aerosol OP with health effect is much better way of uh, cleaning the air as far as health is concerned. Now moving further, how aerosol affect aquatic ecosystem? So we know once again this is our globe, and we know that aerosols can can emit any corner of of this globe, and once it is emitted, it will go along the wind, so it is moving around. And it can remove anywhere via wet and dry deposition. It can remove anywhere. So this actually, this particular cycle become boon for the phytoplankton in remote ocean and lakes because aerosols have different type of nutrients also, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, or iron containing species, which are the part of aerosol. And many places, soluble iron is actually the limiting nutrient. I mean, there are many studies which have shown that soluble iron is the most important micronutrient, limiting micronutrient over ocean. So this aerosol removal becomes the major pathway for the supply of nutrient to the phytoplankton in remote ocean and lakes. So we can understand this better. So why it is important? Because once you have more nutrient, it will increase CO2 uptake. So that means you are with, when drawing more CO2 from the atmosphere and putting into ocean the, through this biological pump. And the deeper the carbon sink, means so if it, carbon is going deeper and deeper, say if, can, if it, can, it can reach at uh, the sediment, then it will be there for 10 million of years. If it is in this area, it can retain here for 1000 of years. So that means you can remove the carbon from the atmosphere for longer time and deeper it reach, the longer it will away from the atmosphere. So <clears throat> what is important here is, this most important thing here is this iron 2, iron 2 is soluble iron. But this soluble iron solubility changes during transport. And this was shown by one of my colleague, Srinivas. What they have shown, see this plot. Here, iron total is on x-axis and water soluble iron is on y-axis. And you have different dotted lines. Dotted lines and if it, suppose if point is falling on this line, that means it is 0.01% uh, solubility. Here it is 1.1% solubility, 1%, 10% and 50% solubility. So, means so from here you can understand if points are here, that means 50% solubility, if points are here between 0 0.01 to 0.1% solubility of iron. And if you notice carefully, all this black square are having very low solubility compared to this. And this black square is from Arabian Sea and all these other points are from Bay of Bengal. Why is it so? Because mostly the dust which is coming from the Saharan or means, uh, uh, western part, if it is depositing directly to the Arabian Sea, it is just fresh dust. But if it is going up to Bay of Bengal, that means it is mixing with the endogenic species also while transport. And during the transport, because of the processing, this means it is changing the solubility and making it more soluble. So what is the implication of that? So say suppose means we are depositing the iron over ocean. If you have more solubility, so even if you have less iron you are putting, you are getting more soluble iron to the ocean. If in this solubility is less, so if even if you are putting too much of aerosol with iron, but it, they are not available for the phytoplankton. So that is why this how the solubility is very important. So this change in solubility was shown to be associated with aerosol acidity over the northern Indian Ocean, which was much higher over the Bay of Bengal than that over Arabian Sea, what we have just now discussed. So the question is, does iron solubility largely depends on the source 
or atmospheric processing. So I will show another result which was during my postdoc tenure. So here we were doing the online measurement of iron and potassium along with the number concentration of aerosol and you see the soluble iron during the prescribed burn in Newton, Georgia when the site was impacted by two plumes. You see the co-variability of iron 2 and potassium. Potassium is well known proxy for the biomass burning aerosol. So if there is a co-variability that suggests that biomass burning could be a significant source of soluble iron. Other thing, another place in Atlanta, this, again this is the means, online measurement of iron and sulphate. And what you see here that solubility means iron, soluble iron is increasing when you have higher sulphate. Sulphate is actually sulfuric acid. So it was inferred that aerosol acidity is actually increasing the iron solubility. So in total we can say that source and processing both are important as far as iron solubility is concerned. Now to summarize what we learned so far. Aerosol affect our environment in many different ways from air quality and human health to climate change and surface ocean biochemistry. Aerosol aging in the atmosphere causes numerous transformation in their physical, chemical and optical properties which in turn can modify the assessment of aerosol effects. So comprehensive studies on aerosol physical, chemical and optical characteristics with a good temporal and spatial resolution are inevitable to effectively understand the impacts of ambient aerosols on, the, on, on our environment and also plan our uh, different appropriate mitigation strategies. And with this, I wish to thank you all for listening to me. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for the informative lecture on atmospheric aerosols, their sources, their aging, and their effect on climate, air quality, health, and ecosystem. Any questions?